Hello, is this working? Can people hear me now? Yeah. All right, awesome. Um, well, what you missed was my name. Um, I'm Maureen Conway, in case you don't know who I am. Um, and I'm just really thrilled to welcome you to today's um, book talk with Stephen Greenhouse. Um, uh, it's a great time to be having this conversation. Um, I just want to say at the Economic Opportunities Program, we believe that all individuals should have the opportunity to work with dignity, to start businesses, and to build the lives and livelihood of their choosing. Um, we recognize that race, gender, and place intersect with and intensify the challenge of economic opportunity and economic inequality that we're struggling with in the country right now. Um, and we strive to bring that understanding to the work that we do in communities across the country to expand opportunity for all. Um, and today, we're talking about the past, present, and future of American labor. Uh, today is a good time to be talking about that with uh, workers now on strike at GM, with California legislature uh, AB5, and addressing the status of gig economy workers. Um, so there's a lot of labor issues sort of in the news and really present for us. Um, but it's also a really important topic right now, because right now, we find ourselves in a time when, despite record low unemployment, there are still far too many people who are, um, who are struggling. Wages haven't grown very much, uh, and, and there's just uh, too, much, too much month and not enough paycheck for far too many working families. Um, we find ourselves at a time when the millennial generation is, is struggling, despite being the best educated generation that we have, have had in this country. They uh, have l lower earnings and less wealth than previous generations did at their age. Uh, we find ourselves at a time when many people are sort of just questioning the premise of the American dream, that if you, if you work hard, if you get a decent education, if you play by the rules, you'll be able to at least build a decent life. Uh, people are questioning whether that's still true, whether their, their kids will, in fact, be able to do better than they can. And there's a lot of research that's uh, showing there's reason to have these serious questions about that. Um, there's people who are questioning whether they can ever even afford to have children. So we have a, a lot of questions about work that are, that are really important. And people are really wondering kind of what's gone wrong. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of automation, of artificial intelligence, of globalization, and how those forces have been reshaping work. And those are important conversations. Uh, but there's been less discussion of how organizations of working people themselves have shaped work, what the history of that has been, uh, why labor organizations fell into decline in the United States, and, and sort of what's going on now with organizations of working people and how they might again play a role in shaping work. So this is an important element to add to the conversation about work, and that's the conversation we, we want to have today. Um, and I can't think of anybody better to have it with than Stephen Greenhouse, who is a uh, longtime labor reporter. Am I supposed to say how long? Um, maybe not. <laughs> but has been following labor issues for, for a long time, um, researched even uh, earlier than his, his own working life in his new book, um, and really has, has, uh, has a really insightful book um, on sort of this history of labor, um, the present, and, and what might be um, happening in the future. Uh, so it's really terrific to have Stephen here today. And before I welcome him to the podium, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, so one, I do want to remind everybody that we're uh, live streaming and recording the event, so please do silence your phones. Um, but please do tweet. Our hashtag is TalkGoodJobs. Um, and uh, I also want to, to thank our longtime supporters for the Working in America series, the Ford Foundation, the Walmart Foundation, and Prudential Financial, who've really been important uh, in bringing the wide array, wide array of conversations in the Working in America series that we've been able to, to have um, to share with you all. So um, I'm very grateful to them for their, for their support. Um, and what we're going to do today is, uh, so I'm going to invite Stephen to the podium. He's going to, to give a talk for about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, then we'll sit in the lovely red chairs, and I'll ask him a few questions for a little bit, and then we'll engage all of you in the, in the conversation. Um, so uh, you have more information about Stephen in, your, in the materials on your chair, uh, but please join me in welcoming uh, Stephen Greenhouse. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Maureen. 
Uh, very nice to be here. Uh, I'm honored that so many of you have come out on this uh, another fairly steamy Washington day. I, I first want to thank the Aspen Institute for, for inviting me today, and especially to Maureen Conway and for the Institute staff for hosting me. And I want to thank the Institute for all the important work it has been doing for, ye for years to help make workplaces across Amer America better, fairer places for everybody and to bring more dignity to workers as well. Uh, I want to be begin by answering a question that many of you might have. I imagine some of you are wondering, Greenhouse, how in the world did you manage to write a serious 400-page book when you seem to be on Twitter 24 hours a day? The truth is, I don't spend quite that much time on Twitter. When I was writing my first book, The Big Squeeze, Tough Times for the American Worker, I generally chilled by playing hearts on my computer for an hour or two a day. But while writing this book, Beaten Down, Worked Up, I changed my strategy. I instead played Twitter for an hour or two a day. But I'll tell you, there's one big advantage of playing hearts over Twitter. When you play hearts, you don't have trolls firing back and calling you an enemy of the people, or a communist, or something anti-Semitic, or writing, how can we believe anything you say? You used to work for the fake New York Times. Yes, sometimes I too feel beaten down and worked up. Five or six years ago, when I was still at the New York Times, my editor at Knopf, Jonathan Siegel, invited me to lunch one day, telling me he wanted to ask me something. Over some schnapps and pasta, he shared a concern with me. Young Americans know very little about labor unions, know very little about what they've achieved, and they don't really understand what it means to have unions and worker power so weak in, in, in a nation in the United States. So he asked me, can I, Steve, recommend anyone who, who could write a good history of labor? I told him, John, I'm no dummy. I know you're asking me, do I, Steve, want to write a history of labor? I told him that while I, as a New York Times reporter, did a lot of writing the first rough draft of history, sometimes the draft had too many mistakes, uh, I told him I wasn't a professional historian who felt comfortable taking a deep dive into archival material. As my wife will tell you, I'm already a total slob when it comes to throwing away papers. And if I started bringing home archival material and original sources to our apartment, yikes, we'd probably get a divorce. Besides, I told my editor, John Siegel, there are some very good comprehensive labor histories that have been recently published. Uh, Joe McCartan and Melvin Dubofsky have a, have a great one. Um, uh, Philip Dre wrote a very good book, There's Power in a Union, like an 800, 900 page history. Uh, I told my editor, John Siegel, that I know a lot about the current situation for unions and workers. So he and I did some haggling. We didn't need a mediator. We did some negotiating. And we agreed I'd write a not overly long history of labor, about 200 pages. And then for the second half of the book, I'd really look at the current state of labor today. So in, in this book, I had three objectives. First, I wanted to write a highly readable book that explains the history of labor and the important things that unions have achieved. Accomplishments like the 40-hour week, safer workplaces, employer-sponsored pensions and health coverage. There's much, much truth to the bumper sticker, unions, the folks who brought you the weekend. I devote a chapter to the uprising of the 20,000 in 1909. The uprising of the 20,000 was an apparel worker strike in New York's Lower East Side, which was, to that time, the largest strike by women in American history. Those 20,000 women were not fighting for the 40-hour week. They were fighting for a 52-hour week. Many of them were tired of working from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day. Sometimes they'd say during the fall and winter, they'd be at work before the sun came up and leave work after the sun went down, and they were frustrated and unhappy about not seeing the sun. So they did win their 52-hour week, and they did win something that was very important at that time. They won the right not to have to continue paying for the needles and thread they used while working. Sometimes they had to pay to rent the chairs they sat on. Sometimes they had to pay to, you know, for the water that they, that they used in the factories. <clears throat> a second aim of the book, I wanted to sound the alarm about a hugely important phenomenon that far too few Americans understand or pay attention to. And that is that worker power in America has fallen to a dismal low. I submit to its uh, lowest point since World War II and probably since the Great Depression. And I mean that both in the workplace and in politics and policy making. 
as a result of this decline in, in worker power, lots of things are out of whack, making millions of Americans feel the system is deeply rigged. We saw how that played out in the 2016 election, election when an orange-haired demagogue embraced the theme that the system is rigged. And we're now seeing how this administration is, day after day, rigging the system further against workers and in favor of the wealthy. Examples, when, when the Trump administration rolled back the extension of overtime pay to millions more workers, the Obama administration uh, announced a fiduciary rule requiring Wall Street firms to act in the best interest of workers and retirees when handling their 401ks. Trump scrapped that rule. Uh, Trump has weakened, has sought to weaken safety rules for coal miners, has weakened safety rules for, for oil and gas workers. OSHA has far fewer safety inspectors than has been the case for years. Just, and, and, and Trump's NLRB in many, many ways is making it harder to unionize. For instance, uh, you know, there's a push to have Uber and Lyft drivers declared employees rather than independent contractors. Both Trump's Department of Labor and NLRB basically issued uh, strong advisory opinions saying they should be considered independent contractors and, and not able to unionize. We'll talk about Assembly Bill 5 in California in a few minutes. Um, my book examines how the decline of worker power in the US has fueled decades of wage stagnation and caused income inequality income inequality to be the worst it's been since the gilded age of the 1920s, the roaring 20s, and how the decline in worker power has helped skew our system so that our politics and policy making are dominated by corporations and wealthy donors. John Kenneth Galbraith wrote about the importance of labor unions being a countervailing power to corporate power. Unfortunately, unions are not so much of a countervailing power anymore. Uh, worker power has fallen to such a low that the President of the United States has seen fit to name as our Labor Secretary a man who was long corporate America's top gun, its top lawyer, in fighting against new worker protections. If, if worker power weren't so weak, if worker power was strong, I can't imagine any President doing something like that. Donald Trump trumpets how great things are for workers now, but things aren't so great for workers. Wages for the typical worker, believe it or not, remain around where they were in 1973, 46 years ago, after inflation, after factoring in inflation. There's the famous chart that shows from 1946 to 1973, employee productivity and employee compensation basically rose hand in hand at the same rate. Since 1973, employee compensation has rose one-sixth as fast as employee productivity. So workers are not sharing nearly as much in their increased productivity and what they give to corporations that was the case after World War II when unions are far stronger. Um, then there's a study that found that CEO pay has risen by 940% since 1978, more, going up more than tenfold, while worker compensation has risen only about 12%. So there's a real, uh, you know, the the, uh, ripple effects, the, the damage from uh, weakened worker power is very serious. My book's third objective, so I, you know, I have this depressing, you know, the first third of the book is really about the rise of unions and what they contributed. The second third of the book looks at the decline of unions, why they've declined, you know, the air traffic controller strike and how that was a disaster for labor, uh, how globalization weakened unions how Scott Walker and his billionaire friends like the Koch brothers conspired, you know, worked together to really cripple public sector unions in Wisconsin. And, and I explain, you know, how unions have gotten so much weaker and what that means for, for typical Americans. And I didn't want to end the book on a depressing note. So the last third of the book really looks at models and strategies and proposals for strengthening worker power. So I wanted to book, the, so I write about efforts to unionize Uber and Lyft drivers, about the Red for Ed teacher strikes, about the Fight for 15, and about the Coalition of Mockley Workers, which has done a tremendous job ending terrible conditions for 35,000 tomato workers in Florida. The last time I was at the Institute, I was on a panel discussing uh, the marvelous Coalition of Mockley Workers, which really has done an amazing job. You know, the, as I describe in my chapter on my book, it really had, Florida, 
around the Immokalee area really had the worst conditions for farm, farm, farm workers in the United States. Many were held in virtual servitude slavery, uh, thanks to the coalition Immokalee workers bringing uh, farm workers together, figuring out strategies to pressure um, to, you know, companies that ordered lots of tomatoes like Taco Bell and McDonald's. They in turn pressured, got the tomato growers to agree to raise wages and vastly improve standards. So I, you know, I write about models like that. You know, at a time that unions are much weaker, uh, what can be done, what strategies can be ad adopted to, to raise workers in general? I also write about one of the nation's most impressive, most successful labor unions, the Culinary Workers Union in Las Vegas, which has gone from having 18,000 workers in the 1980s to 60,000 today. And, and the dishwash, you know, it's a union that has catapulted thousands of, of immigrant dishwashers and, and hotel housekeepers into the middle class. And not only that, in 2016, when Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin flipped from blue to red, uh, the Culinary Workers Union played a pivotal role in flipping Nevada from red to blue. Um, so people often ask, well, say, you know, unions aren't very good, they're outmoded, what do they do for workers? Well, you know, various academic studies show that union members earn 14% more than comparable non-union workers after adjusting for education, age, and other factors, and that 14% uh, was more like 20-25% decades ago when unions were much stronger. 75% of unionized workers participate in employer-sponsored health plans compared to 49%, 76% to 49% for non-union workers. 83% of union members have an employer-sponsored retirement plan, while just 49% of non-union workers do. And unions, people don't realize, often help close, reduce the gender pay gap. Women workers and unions are paid on average 94 cents to the dollar paid to unionized male workers. That hasn't totally closed the gap, but it's much better than for non-union women workers who earn 78 cents to the dollar compared with non-union men. African-American union members earn on average 16.4% more than comparable non-union black workers. In my first book, The Big Squeeze, Tough Times for the American Worker, I focused on what I call one disconcerting disconnect. Forgive me, I like alliterations. In the first decade of this century, corporate profits and the stock market kept climbing to new records while corporations kept squeezing down wages, cutting back health and retirement benefits, offshoring jobs, making jobs more precarious, pushing workers to work harder, just making good jobs worse jobs. Sadly, that disconnect has very much continued this decade. Too many, many corporations are going like gangbusters, and workers are still not close to getting their fair share. I think that's playing out with the GM strike that began this morning. In my new book, Beaten Down, Worked Up, I focus on another disconcerting disconnect. Gallup just found, a recent Gallup poll issued last month, month just found that unions have a 64% approval rating nearly the highest level in 50 years. That's gone up 16 percentage points in the past uh, 10 years, which is a very big increase. Also, a recent MIT study headed by Tom Koken found that 50 percent of non-union, non-managerial workers say they want to join, they, they'd want to join a union if they could. That's up from 32 percent in the 1990s. That means basically that one in two non-union union workers say they would like to be in a union, yet just 6.4, one in 16 private sector workers is in a union. So that's another serious disconnect. In my book, I explain why this is the case. And I explain that in no other industrial nation do corporations fight as hard to beat back, indeed, quash labor unions. I'm not saying labor unions are perfect. You know, they, there's been way too much discrimination against uh, women workers against workers of color. There's, there was far too much corruption in the Teamsters and the Longshoremen once upon a time. There's still too much corruption, unfortunately, in the United Auto Workers right now. Um, so Kate Bronfenbrenner of Cornell University is really the leading scholar in examining you know, the strategies that employers use to beat back unions. And Kate found that during unionization drives, 89% of employers require workers to attend anti-union meetings where an anti-union consultant says, you know, you don't need a union, you don't need a third party, they just want your dues money, they, you know, 
you know, they're corrupt, you know, you don't need them. 50% of employers threaten to close operations if workers vote to unionize. 47% threaten to cut wages or benefits if workers unionize. Uh, that study also found that 63% of employers interrogate workers in one-on-one -on -one meetings about whether they supported a union. That's actually illegal to do. 34% uh, of employers fired uh, rank-and-file union supporters. 28% of employers attempted to infiltrate the union organizing committee. In her studies about what employers do to beat back unions, Kate Bronfenbrenner gave some really juicy examples. For example, when a Fruit of the Loom factory in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas confronted an organizing effort, it posted yard signs in the community saying, keep jobs in the valley, vote no. Fruit of the Loom hung a banner across the factory saying, wear the union label, unemployed. In the last chapter of my book, I discussed proposals on how to rebuild worker power. Uh, Demo the Democratic candidates are talking about strengthening unions more than ever before. I've been writing about labor for around 25 years now. I was labor and workplace reporter for 19 years at the Times, and since I took the buyer from the Times in 2014, I've continued to write a lot. And never before have I seen Democratic candidates talk nearly as much about the importance of strengthening unions. And I think part of that is they realize that you know, Hillary Clinton lost because she didn't do enough to woo workers and unions. Part of that, I believe, is they realize that uh, if the Democrats are going to win again, the surest path is to uh, win back Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And they know that to do that, it will really help to strengthen unions. You know, Wisconsin, thanks to, in Wisconsin, thanks to Scott Walker's efforts uh, to weaken unions, union membership has fallen by 43%, by 177,000 in the past decade. Trump won Wisconsin by 22,000 votes. In Michigan, largely because of the auto, the auto industry crisis, but also because uh, of a right to work law and some other anti-union actions, union membership has fallen 144,000 in the past decade. Donald Trump won Michi Michigan by 11,000 votes. Um, so while the playing field uh, is tilted in favor of unions during unionization drives, I, I, with, with the playing field tilted so much in favor of employers, I call for giving union organizers a lot more access to the employer's property commu to communicate with workers. You know, employers have 24 access to workers during unionization drives. They, they you know, show anti-union videos in the lunchroom, in the break room. They have these uh, meetings where anti-union consultants uh, talk to workers. I, I went to uh, University of Pennsylvania Med Medical Center to write about a, a unionization drive there. And on everyone's commuter, computer uh, was, a, uh, was an anti-union uh, screensaver. Um, so, I, I call, so under the National Labor Relations Act, passed under uh, Franklin Roosevelt in 1935 to give American workers a right to unionize, uh, that was a signal law, but under it, employers cannot face one penny in fines for firing workers illegally for trying to unionize. So a lot of the candidates are saying we need stiff penalties uh, when unions fight illegally against unionization drives. There are a lot of good ideas out there about how to rebuild unions, but I have several concerns. I believe if some of these steps were enacted, private sector union density still wouldn't increase much maybe from 6.4% to 10% over several years. Or you know, Bernie Sanders talks about wanting to double union membership in, in four years. So that, that would be forward progress from 6.4% in the private sector to 12.8%. But worker power would still be fairly weak. That's why Mary Kay Henry, president of the SAIU, said in a major speech last month that we need to go beyond these proposals for labor law reform and go directly to industry-wide or sectoral bargaining. And a story I did for the New York Times, I wrote about an example of sectoral bargaining in Denmark, where this industry-wide bargaining for fast food workers, McDonald's workers average over $20 an hour. And that was at a time a few years ago when McDonald's workers in the US averaged about $8 an hour. So uh, a lot of union people say, you know, let's go right to industry-wide bargaining, which is hard when you just have 6.4% of, of uh, private sector workers and unions because you have much more strength in an industry-wide bargaining than employer-by-employer employer bargaining. 
The second big problem I, I argue in my book to, to serious labor reform that would strengthen unions and strengthen worker power is that to, you know, to enact any of these measures, workers face a huge roadblock, which is America's hugely broken campaign finance system. In the 2016 election cycle, business outspent labor 16 to 1. Corporations donated $3.4 billion, while unions donated $213 million. Uh, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, a, a nonpartisan group, every year corporations spend around $3 billion in law, on lobbying in Washington, while unions spend about $48 million, 160th as much. So there's little wonder that many lawmakers seem vastly more interested in giving $1 trillion in tax cuts to corporations when corporate profits and the stock market were already at record levels and why, corporate, why lawmakers in Congress are doing so little to raise the minimum wage, even though the minimum wage hasn't been raised in over a decade, the longest it hasn't been raised since 1938 when the federal minimum wage was first established. I think everyone who hopes to lift America's workers, I think that every American who cares about building a fairer economy and fairer nation needs to focus far more on fixing our broken campaign finance system. I think something's really wrong when Sheldon Adelson or the Koch brothers have like a million times as much voice in politics as the typical school teacher or, or, uh, or a steel worker or, or, or janitor. I like to end on this point. Corporate executives often say that we don't need labor unions, that corporate America and its human resources departments will make sure that workers are taken care of. In my, in, in my book, I include Martin Luther King Jr.'s response to such a notion. Dr. King said, the labor movement was the principal force that transformed misery and despair into hope and progress. Out of its bold struggles, economic and social reform gave birth to unemployment insurance, old age pensions, government relief for the destitute, and above all, new wage levels that meant not mere survival, but a tolerable life. The captains of industry did not lead this transformation. They resisted it until they were overcome. So thank you, Maureen. Thank you to the Aspen Institute for inviting me today. Well, that was terrific. Thank you, thank you. so much. Um, and I think uh, I'm, I'm going to start with, uh, I, I feel bound at this point to, to say, um, the Aspen Institute is a nonpartisan organization. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, but as we were talking before, I think this issue of, of partisanship as it intersects with work has become just really too much, honestly. I, I, I talk with Republicans who um, are concerned about the quality of jobs. I talk with Republicans who say I'm not against um, uh, worker, uh, you know, collective bargaining and worker organizing. I talk with Republicans who admire Samuel Gompers and, um, you know, and, and others from labor and, you know, but, um, but it's be become so, so bound up in sort of partisanship and stuff. And I'm, and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about, you, you know, and most, most people actually care about good jobs and, and people being able to make a living, right? So, so do you have any thoughts about sort of how sure, this can sure. become less of a partisan divide? So I started covering labor for the New York Times in 1995. And back then, there were about 20 seriously pro-labor Republicans in Congress, led by, I think, Jack Quinn in Buffalo. And Jack was a great guy. And like, he wanted to make unions stronger. He wanted to raise the minimum wage. But now, it's really unclear whether there are any pro-labor Republicans in Congress. And, you know, I, you know, the parties move further to the right. Maybe they weeded out people who were seen as pro-labor. And yes, you know, a lot of Republicans say we're all for unions, but you know, when they're pushed to vote, it's often you know for a right to work or to take away prevailing wage. Um, and uh, you know, so you know, one of the big points I make in my book that's been picked up is that the United States suffers from this horrid anti-worker exceptionalism, where the only industrial nation that doesn't ha have laws guaranteeing paid parental leave, paid maternity leave. We're the only industrial nation that doesn't have laws guaranteeing paid vacation, paid or, un uh, paid or unpaid even. In the European Union, the 28 nations, workers are guaranteed at least four weeks 
uh, where the, we in South Korea are the only two industrial nations that don't have laws guaranteeing paid sick days. And you tell this to people in Europe, and they're like, you're the United States, you're the richest nation on earth. How could you not have these very basic things to make family work balance easier? And, you know, Democrats want to pass laws that, you know, give work, you know, guarantee workers paid sick days, paid, you know, uh, paid parental leave. And generally, Republicans don't. So, like, what's going on here? Um, and I think a lot of Republicans, unfortunately, have become hugely beholden to corporate donors and corporate lobbyists. And, and mm -hmm. that's why I say we have to fix um, campaign you know, the finance. campaign finance. Yeah. And yeah, so, so Ivanka Trump has come out with this proposal to have you know, paid parental leave. Mm -hmm. And the way, well, it kills me that you know, Trump and the Republicans gave away $1 trillion to corporations when they already had record profits without asking anything whatsoever in return. And Donald Trump says he's a great deal maker and a big friend of workers. Like, why not tell corporations, well, we're going to give you this $1 trillion, but we're going to demand paid parental leave in return. He, he asks for nothing. So Ivanka Trump proposes paid parental leave, but not at all paid for by employers, paid for by workers out of their Social Security. So if you want 10 weeks paid parental leave, then you'll delay, you know, when you turn 65 or 68, then you'll delay by 10 weeks or however when you get Social Security. So like, you know, Republicans don't want to take any action that any, that corporate America says is a horrible employer mandate. And, and that's really broken. And I'm not sure how you fix it unless you, you fix the campaign finance system, maybe, you know, reduce gerrymandering so that people can run toward the middle rather than run towards this, the edges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to. I want to go back a little. Although, um, you know, it's interesting this weekend. You know, with the um, with the auto workers going on strike and having just sort of sort of read your book, I was. You know, the the <laughs> the line that occurred to me was was Faulkner's. Uh, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Um, and I'm curious what you thought in terms of the similarities of this. I mean, you know, sort of that was sort of the. The, the home of the, the great sit-down strike and, and all of that, and sort of how do you think about sort of what was, what are some of the similarities and differences kind of then and now? That's a very good question. So I didn't think the, G, the UAW was going to go on strike against GM. Um, but, you know, so yesterday, the day before, we, we really learned they're dead serious about doing it. I think part of it is you know, workers are feeling, you know, the wind at their back recently. Uh, you know, the teacher strikes really opened people's eyes that, hey, collective worker power, collective worker action uh, can get very good results and win huge community support. There was this, the strike earlier this year by 30,000 stop and shop workers where, you know, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Beto O'Rourke, Pete Buttigieg, you know, a lot of the candidates went up there to pick it, pick it with them. And they saw, you know, you know the UAW and other Labor people saw that you know we get lots of public support, we get lots of political support, and I think that influenced the GM workers. And I think you know they're very fed up that GM. You know, it's amazing. It's GM has fewer workers in the U.S. now than Ford and Fiat Chrysler, which is like because GM is always the largest American right. corporation that really opens one eyes. So I think you know a lot of the auto workers are like fed up that GM has moved so many jobs to Mexico mm -hmm. and China and elsewhere. And it closed the Lordstown, the huge Lordstown plant, which is making the Chevy Cruze, while GM continues to make the Chevy Cruze in Mexico. So that's one level of answer. Yeah. Another is, so you know, when there's a strike at GM, that historically is a big deal. And I and I devote two chapters in my book to two famous famous uh, landmark strikes at GM. One is the Flint sit-down strike of 1936-37, which many people say was the most important strike of the 20th century, where GM, then the nation's, the world's largest company, for years, you know, crushed the unions. You know, it, it helped get police on horseback to literally beat strikers. It had, you know, hundred, you know, had many, many spies to uh, infiltrate union efforts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 2,000 workers in the dead of winter in Flint, Michigan, went on strike for two months and managed to get the world's most powerful company to sit down and agree to unionize. And that really began the huge wave of unionization in the late 1930s and during World War II. And then you know, the great Walter Ruther, in my mind, the greatest labor leader of the 20th century. I have a chapter about him. And 
know, there was a huge GM strike right after World War II. Workers were fed up about um, wage freezes during World War II, and this huge strike by 175,000 workers, 49,000 workers now. Back then, it was 175,000. They went on strike for uh, nearly four months, 112 days. And, and GM was so upset by the strike that in the, in the next round of negotiations, it negotiated a landmark deal called the Treaty of Detroit that gave workers, in effect, a 20% raise after inflation over five years and gave workers the best health coverage and pensions of any unionized workers in the nation. That, again, more than anything else, really went far to create the middle class. Hundreds of other employers copied that. So, so this, so this, you know, the UAW, GM is much smaller comparatively, the UAW is much smaller comparatively. But again, I think people pay a special attention when there's a UAW strike against GM. And my sense is the UAW is kind of calling the question on continued outsourcing of jobs, kind of influenced by Donald Trump, like it's time to stop that. And, and the UAW also is quick to say, when GM went bankrupt in 2009, we gave all sorts of concessions for it to get back on its feet. And now, when GM has profits of $8.1 billion, it's, it's not rewarding us enough. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting that also, you know, I, I wonder about this one, though. So the other, the other one I was thinking about when I was looking at the, the UAW strike, I wonder about whether they really do have the same level of sympathy as sort of the teacher strikes, right? right that's so the a good teachers, question. if you look at teachers, you think like everyone loves I, teachers. Everybody, everybody loves teachers. I am dismayed that my kids' teachers have to have a second job, right? I think about how that actually influences their ability as teachers, as well as sort of, you know, sort of. Um, so, and and I'm curious, you know, so there's a couple of things that I that I think about with that. One, I'm I'm curious if you think that 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 sort of idea from the teacher strike that people started to to hear that a little bit, like if you want your teachers to do a good job, they need to have a good job, kind of thing. If you think that that's that's ingrained in, um, uh, but but also I'm wondering if if it's just more that. Um, work like teaching and healthcare and things are the the work that we have. We don't have as much industrial workers, so I'm wondering if that also limits people's ability at this point to sort of relate to UAW strikes. Not as many people know people who work in work in manufacturing. I, I don't know if you. So, think so that. several answers. Um, so, 15 years ago, there was a strike by rubber workers against I think Bridgestone. Maybe 5,000 workers that went on for like six months. And I couldn't get my editors at the New York Times interested. They said, you know, it's a private sector strike. Why does it, why should our, why should our readers care? Yeah. So, you know, I pick up the New York Times today. Lead story is strike by, so, you know, 50,000 a lot more than, than, than 5,000. Right. GM is a lot more important than Bridgestone. But, you know, I think labor issues have come to the fore with all the talk about income inequality and wage stagnation and we're in the system being rigged. So I think that's one thing. But. But you're right, a lot of people don't feel they know industrial workers the way everyone knows, mm -hmm. knows and loves teachers. Now, if you asked me three, four years ago, how's labor doing, I would have said it's kind of dead in the water. You know, it was slowly going down. It was really set back by Donald Trump's victory. You know, you know union leaders really thought that Hillary was going to win because they were going to deliver Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. That didn't happen. And, you know, I think the teacher strike, you know, like came out of nowhere. Man. And, and you know, I, I write about you know, Jay O'Neill and Emily Comer, these, you know, this English teacher and, and Spanish teacher in Charleston, West Virginia, and like how they got the ball rolling. And teachers are educated, they're proud, they see what's going on, and they were just fed up that they hadn't had raises in four or five years. And then the governor, who happened to be West Virginia's richest man, said, well, I'm gonna give you a 1% raise per year for the next five years. And that's all while they had to pay higher health premiums each year. And they, they said, basically, we're not going to take it anymore. And, and they said they were inspired by West Virginia's you know, glorious history of, of coal miner strike. And they were also amazed at the extent of community support they got. So mm -hmm. I really think the teacher strike has really inspired other strikes. Uh, I think you know, successful strikes beget other strikes.
Yeah, and I was wondering because uh, sort of you know there's also the unsuccessful strikes and and in particular the air traffic controllers which you write about and I'd never really read this history of the air traffic controller strike and one of the things that was interesting to me was was the things you identified that they kind of did wrong um, and you know so I was thinking about that when I was also looking at the the UAW strike especially given the corruption cases that they have and everything do they have people sympathy and do they have you know, sort of enough people kind of with them in this. And, um, but anyway, but maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of kind of what went wrong with the air traffic controllers over some of the mistakes that they, that they made and, and why that was so damaging. So I, I write about, you know, the rise of labor, you know, Walter Ruth, the Treaty of Detroit, this amazing contract in 1950 that really was a milestone in building the middle class. And I write about the Memphis sanitation worker strike, which was a milestone in the civil rights movement, the labor rights movement. At great, great, great cost, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated when he was in Memphis, you know, helping the workers. Then I write about the decline of labor, and I start with the discussion of the air traffic controller strike in 1981. And you know, some of you were not around back then. So 13,000 air traffic controllers went on an illegal strike. They were demanding uh, raises like three, four times other federal workers all while wanting their work week to go from five days a week to four days a week. And they were kind of arrogant. They thought, you know, we're vastly underpaid. We should be paid every bit as much as airline pilots. Um, and they went on this illegal strike against a new conservative president, Ronald Reagan. They didn't line up support from other unions. They had very little public backing. And, you know, if you're going to go on a strike, even a legal strike, it's important to have public backing. So they went on an illegal strike without conferring with other unions, without lining up public backing. So they were confident they were going to shut down the nation's airports and, and, and force Ronald Reagan to, to cry uncle, to come begging and say, we want you back, we'll give you whatever you want. But uh, Reagan shocked them. You know, a few hours after the strike started here in the Rose Garden, uh, Reagan announced that you know, those of you, you know, this is an illegal strike. Every air traffic controller vowed on, on his or her first day of work to you know, not not to not to walk out, not to strike. He and Reagan said, if you don't come back within 48 hours, you're fired. And people thought he was bluffing, but 48 hours later, they sent out notice to 11,300 air traffic controllers. 1,700 of the 13,000 who walked out did return to work, and the. Um, the federal government got the airports running again, far better than the controllers ever, ever thought the government could, and the strike was totally crushed. You know, there wasn't much support from other unions. It was hard for them to do much. There was, you know, and the public was hugely against these strikers mm -hmm. because they came across not only just as illegal, but kind of asking for, you know, like a little bit spoiled. You know, at, you know when, when President Kennedy gave federal workers the right to unionize and bargain collectively, he did not give them the right to bargain over wages. And still in 1981, when the strike took place, the federal government was still, in theory, prohibited from bargaining over wages. And uh, the Reagan administration did kind of sub rosa secretly agree to bargain over wages and gave them, awarded them twice as much as other federal workers. But the air traffic controllers said, that's still not nearly enough. So they, you know, they didn't have their ear to the ground. The union was run by extreme militants without much experience in union affairs, and they really ran into a buzz, buzz saw. Yeah. yeah, no, that was fascinating. I never really, I never really knew that, that history. The other thing that was interesting that you bring out, and it comes out in a couple of times, is you know, that Reagan, was, as, an, as a new president, needed to sort of look strong, and he needed to look strong sort of domestically, but also you know, in terms of foreign policy dealings. And this idea that sort of how presidents think about um, labor relations and their their work with unions and and just their labor policies is influenced by foreign policy it was never I hadn't really thought about that very much before but it was interesting how that came out also sort of in the post-war era where we're trying to sort of look like people are you know people here are better off than in Soviet Russia and so on and so forth and and I'm just wondering if you could sort of comment on th that role of sort of foreign affairs and foreign policy and sort of influencing labor sure. politics so you know, the, the strike took place in August 1981, which is a few months after the assassinated, assassination attempt against Reagan at the Washington Hilton. He, you know, people really, a lot of people saw him as a hero, so he was very 
popular then, and the union is taking on this very popular president. And you know, Reagan's aides, you know, on one hand, they said it's important for this new president, who's only been in, in office for a few months, to show his strength, to show he's, he can't be cowed, to show he's not going to back down. So I think you know, to show the Soviet Union this, to show other leaders yeah. this. And I think it was important to them for, to have Reagan hang tough. Also, Maureen, you know, a lot of Reagan aides were very conservative and not, you know, and really disliked unions. I don't think Reagan disliked unions so much. People forget he was president of the Screen Actors Guild. He led, as president of that guild, he led them out on, on their very first strike. But there were some Reagan aides who like wanted to zap unions, and they were more than happy to take down the air traffic controllers. And, and they, they helped push him. You know, there was a big push after he fired them, like six months later, a year later. Well, you know, grant them amnesty, let's rehire them. And these folks said, no, 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 we have to show that we're hanging tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, um, so I, uh, I, I wanted to go back a little bit to the sort of the, the King and the Memphis sanitation workers, but I'm going to back my way into it because, um, you know, I'm thinking about this and, and, you know, I remember some of the, this history and I sort of came of age in the, in the 80s and, um, uh, you know, and, and that did really have, I think, an influence in sort of how people learn to think about unions, right, and union members as being spoiled, as you, as you mentioned. And then, you know, when I sort of started first doing my, my professional work in the early 90s, working in communities across the, across the country with sort of nonprofit organizations that are trying to help low-income people get to better jobs and, and all of this kind of thing, I, I ran into a lot of organizations that really did not like unions, right? And one of the main reasons was because they're keeping our people out, right? So unions were racist, were sexist, were, were, were not welcoming to communities of color and to, to low-income groups in general. And so, you know, I think that this, but, you know, they have this sort of mixed history. Then there's this sort of history with, the, with how Martin Luther King had a, not perfect relationship, but a relationship with with labor, and you know, I'm just wondering, sort of, how you know, do you think there's sort of lessons learned within the labor movement from from that, and and sort of how would you kind of kind of characterize their their history in terms of in terms of being inclusive? So, uh, you know, it's no secret that you know labor movement was not usually inclusive early in its history, and you know, one of the things I learned while you know doing research for this book was that you know, Sam, the great Samuel Gombers could be, you know, said some really racist things, especially against immigrants from China. And I also learned that he was one of the main forces in the enactment of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1981. And a lot of unions in the AFL-CIO, especially construction unions and railroad unions, you know, were just totally segregated. And another great labor leader, A. Philip Randolph, who headed the uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, kept pushing the FSAO to like, you know, expel segregated unions. And he was urging George Meany, who was head of the FSAO in the 1950s and 60s, like, you gotta get tough, you gotta get tough, you gotta expel these guys. And, and, and at one point, Meany lectured, you know, lectured uh, A. Philip Randolph saying, who are you to speak for the nation's Negroes? Like, and you know, A. Philip Randolph <laughs> was, you know, he, tried putting together a march on Washington in the 1940s to pressure Franklin Delano Roosevelt to agree to integrate the defense industries. And he persuaded Roosevelt to do that. This is 22 years before the 1963 march on Washington. And, and it was A. Philip Randolph, not Martin Luther King, who was the main organizer of the march on Washington. And, and uh, Randolph, it was A. Philip Randolph who really got Harry Truman to agree to integrate the armed forces generally. And, um, so you know, I think unions really learn their lesson. And, and, and so you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was a huge supporter of labor, but sometimes he'd go speak to the FLCO. And on one hand, he'd say, you're too segregated, and I'm pissed off at you, Mr. Meany, for how you've treated A. Philip Randolph. On the other hand, he said, you know, labor, you know, unions can't get any, anywhere without us you know, African Americans, and we blacks can't get anywhere without unions. So he realized the importance of unions. And, you know, in, in, in uh, you know, 1967, 1968, he launched this, pair, this poor people's movement. He said the Civil Rights Act were good in winning political rights for, for blacks, but didn't do nearly enough to lift blacks economically. So he launched this poor people's campaign. And he was really, you know, 
working very hard to set that up, and then the Memphis sanitation workers went on strike. And I, you know, I profile a sanitation worker whom I interviewed at length, Elmore Nickelberry, who's now in his 80s. And he talked about, you know, um, you know, he, you know, he, he, you know, he was a captain. He served in South Korea during the Korean War. He was a captain in the army. He comes back to Memphis in 1953, and everyone's still calling him boy. And I quote him saying, "I was treated with more dignity, with more respect in South Korea than I was in in, in Memphis." And he got a sanitation job, and his bosses always called him boy. And if they came in five minutes late, they might be sent home for the day, and they would, you know go into people's backyards and pick up these tubs of garbage that they'd often put on their head or, or, their, or their backs and uh, tubs would have holes in them and the garbage juice would you know, seep down their bodies and they'd go back to the garages at the end of the day and there are no showers. You know, they're in Memphis, you know, you're working in 90, 95 degrees. It was crazy. So they went on strike and it was you know, a really a strike for dignity. You know, I am a man. And Martin Luther King, who was really focused on this Poor People's Campaign realized what's happening in Memphis is part and parcel of what I'm doing. And he became very involved in the sanitation workers' causes and gave some astoundingly moving speeches and tragically was assassinated while in Memphis. Yeah. And finally, because the, the mayor of Memphis was a trillion percent ever recognizing a union, and it really took the assassination of Martin Luther King to get the city council to say, hey, this is a disaster for Memphis, for our image, and we better settle the strike. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really, that is such a powerful, powerful story. Um, I mentioned earlier that we pay attention to race, place, and gender, so I'll ask the, the gender question, because I think, you know, some of the earliest leaders, so, and this is sort of a gender and sort of a history question, too, because I think, um, so one, I think one of the, I, I will just say, I, I don't think we learn, I know I, I did not learn much labor history in, in school or, or anything like that. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really learn who Francis Perkins was until I started going to the Francis Perkins building at the Department of Labor, right? So, um, so I, you know, I was, I was pleased to see um, uh, the Von Draley book around, around the, uh, about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire um, assigned to my daughter in high school uh, That's this great. year, so that was awesome. Um, uh, That's a wonderful book, David Van Drael's book on the Triangle Fire. So, um, Triangle. Uh, but one of the, you know, one of the real leaders, like, you know, you learned about sort of all of these women garment workers and how sort of courageous they were, how active they were, how much sort of a lot of that early labor movement women were so, so crucial to people like Clara Limlick and um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk about sort of the role of women a little bit in, in labor history and kind of um, whether, what's happened with, with that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So in this book, I devote a lot of pages to the role of women in labor history. And, and you, know, you know, in the back of my mind, you know, my editor at Knopf said, write a book that college students, college professors will want to assign and college students will want to read. And I really focus a lot on you know, these leaders and what they were doing when they were young and, and how they exercised their agency and courage to really, you know, move things along and how they made historic changes. And I write about this, you know, Jewish immigrant from the Ukraine, Clara Lemlich, you know, who arrived in New York um, at the age of 16, only speaking Yiddish. She wanted to be a doctor. Good luck with that. She, you know, two weeks later, she was working in the sweatshop. And she became a uh, soapbox speaker on behalf of workers' rights and women's rights. And she was this dynamic force at age 23 that led this you know, huge strike, the uprising of 20,000, by more than 20,000 female garment workers. And there was a strike, you know, 90, 95% women. And they faced down the bosses, and they won. And I write about you know, the great Frances Perkins, who, to my mind, is probably the most underrated person in American history. You know, she was. You know, so she, so, um, no argument how to begin. <laughs> uh, you know, she went to Mount Holyoke. Her parents you know, wanted her to be a teacher. She taught at this fancy girls' school north of Chicago, Ferry Hall. On weekends, she spent you know, with Jane Addams and Hull House in Chicago. She got really swept up with helping the poor and helping workers. And she said, that's what I want to dedicate. To her parents' chagrin, she said, that's what I want to dedicate my life to. Her next job is in Philadelphia helping you know, working women, which often meant uh, immigrant women from Europe and African-American women who were tricked 
who were told they were going to get a good job, but they were tricked into prostitution. And then she you know, went to New York and became head of the New York office of the, of the National Consumers League, which originally was an anti-slavery group that sought to boycott uh, goods, you know, cotton goods and sugar goods made, you know, made with slave labor. And you know, she was having tea with a friend on Washington Square when the Triangle Fire broke out, and she ran over and actually witnessed the workers jumping out of windows to their death. And she was named uh, by uh, you know, to head this investigative commission to to really figure out how to ensure that there are no 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 other fires like this ever before. From that, she becomes labor commissioner for then New York Governor Al Smith. Then she becomes labor commissioner for his successor, someone named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So she's his right hand during the when he's governor when during the Depression, and she leads these innovative, the country-leading efforts for, for uh, you, know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, aid for you know, laid-off workers, and, 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 and you know, she's pushing for unemployment insurance, and Roosevelt's elected president, and he offers her position of labor secretary, which would make her the first female cabinet member in the nation. So, you know, little, little Frances Perkins goes into Roosevelt's house on East 65th Street in Manhattan, and Roosevelt says, you know, I'd like you to be labor secretary, and she says, I'll agree only if you accept these conditions, that you push for Social Security, that you push for universal health coverage, I think you, people have heard about that issue, that you push for a 40-hour work week, that you push for a minimum wage, that you push for restrictions on child labor, and, 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 and laws on unemployment insurance. So everything she demanded except universal health coverage was enacted into law, and 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 you know she was you know the behind the scenes hero in, in, in making this happen, and and I quote Collier's magazine saying it shouldn't be called Roosevelt's New Deal, it should be called Francis Perkins' New <laughs> Deal. I mean she was she was amazing. Yeah, yeah, she really was. Um, so if anybody had, doesn't know enough about Francis Perkins, Kirsten Downey has an excellent biography yeah. of her that I would And then more recently, I write about you know, a labor leader in California, Maria Elena Durazzo. And, and you know, she was the daughter of mm -hmm. farm workers, you know, extremely poor. You know, she was one of you know, 11 children. You know, when she was very young, her five-year-old brother died. Her parents, farm workers, couldn't afford to take him to a doctor. The priest had to do a collection to pay for the burial. Uh, you know, she you know got very involved in labor. She founded this group, the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, that has done wonders building alliances between unions and the community and environmentalists. And and she became head of the Los Angeles Federation of Labor. Now she's in the state senate in in uh, in California. She was just elected, and it's foreseen that in four years she will be Senate Majority Leader. So like, these are amazing stories about what. Yeah. You know, so I'm going to come to you all for questions in, in just a second. I'm going to ask you one last question, and I'm glad you brought up, uh, brought up Lane, um, because I, was really, I really think that they're just a fascinating organization as we think about sort of who's kind of responding to people's felt needs in communities now, who's thinking about connecting. You know, I think one of the things that's really interesting about them, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and say our jargony word, intersectionality, right? But they connect sort of issues of environment to issues of work, and they connect sort of like this whole range of issues that do connect to work to, um, to sort of how they engage the community and sustain that engagement and use that as sort of a, a new way forward. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on them, and I know you were talking with sure, Roxana sure. this morning, so it should be a little... So, so in the book, I really tried to examine some very successful models to build worker power. And one was the Culinary Union in Las Vegas, which you know, has gone from 18,000 to 60,000 workers and really has done a marvelous job in raising you know, what are typically low-wage jobs, you know, catapulting these people into middle class. I look at the Coalition of Maki Workers, which has done a great job lifting farm workers. Um, I look at Kaiser Permanente, yeah. which by many measures is the nation's most successful labor management partnership since this partnership was formed in 1995. It's gone from having 57,000 union members to 123,000 union members, and management and labor work very closely together to improve service, to improve efficiency, to you know, figure out ways to raise wages. There's a big labor dispute there right now, unfortunately. And I also devote a chapter to this terrific group, Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, which Maria Elena Durazzo, 
who was head of the Hotel Workers Union in Las Vegas at the time, and her husband, Miguel Contreras, who was head of the Los Angeles Federation of Labor and was like a genius at organi organizing and political organizing. When people ask, how did the state of Ronald Reagan and Pete Wilson flip from red to blue, you know, the untold story is that Miguel Contreras mobilized you know, a lot of the two million immigrants, you know, Hispanic immigrants, Latino immigrants who moved to Las Vegas, made them a political force that flipped politics in Los Angeles and Los Angeles County, and that went very far to flipping mm -hmm. Sacramento. So, so um, Miguel Contreras and Maria Elena Durazzo realized that union, you know, California was a very anti-union state, so they realized that unions are not strong enough, so that if we want to achieve some of our goals, we really need to find partners to leverage our power. So they built very effective coalitions with African American groups, Asian American groups, Hispanic groups, mm -hmm. um, immigrant groups, and you know they have you know made huge gains. They you know enacted this um, kind of uh, leapfrogging the fifty. You know they fight for fifteen. They enacted a. They got the city council to enact a fifteen dollar thirty seven cent wage for uh, hotel workers. A lot of Los Angeles government agencies were very segregated. A lot of construction projects in Los Angeles were very segregated. And Lane played a huge role making sure that these projects hired you know, African-American workers, Latino workers, Asian, Asian American workers, you know, and, and played an instrumental role. You know, of course, San Francisco was going to pass a $15 minimum wage. But Los Angeles, where the cost of living is a lot less, Lane played a big role in getting them to enact a $15 minimum wage. Um, you know, Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy really invented something that's become quite prevalent called community benefits agreements. Um, there was a huge project in Hollywood, and that project included the Dolby Theater where the uh, Academy Awards are presented each year. And Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy and the city councilwoman from there, Jackie Goldberg, basically told the developer, you know, if you want to build this huge project, you have to agree to certain worker-friendly things. You have to hire a certain number of like low-income people from surrounding zip codes. You have to agree not to fight a union. You have to agree to pay a living wage. And, and you know, the developer said, we don't want to do that. And, and then Lane got his friends in the city council to say, unless you agree to this community benefits agreement, we'll deny you, we'll get the city council to deny you permits, we'll get the city council to deny you the 90 million in subsidies you're expecting. And they set up this whole idea of community benefits agreements that yeah. is now done in dozens and dozens of other cities. Yeah, it's really spread. Um, I want to invite people to join the conversation. Excellent, I have lots of questions. So. Um, Bert, Ray, okay, I'll take, a, I'll take, I'll take, go one, two, three, and then uh, you can respond and um, we have a microphone. So why don't you just... Thank you. Um, you haven't mentioned anything about the government agency that's supposed to uh, facilitate uh, elections and things for uh, unions, the NLRB, and I'm wondering if you could talk about their role and why it seems to function less well than it used to. Didn't I say in my opening remarks I, a little I thing take, about the NLRB? I want to take okay. three and then okay, okay. just so we can let okay. more people get, get questions in. I wanted to hear uh, what you thought of what was going on with Volkswagen in Tennessee, where uh, flipping the script from the usual uh, elected officials running interference on behalf of corporations, the parent corporation actually said, we'd be happy if there was a union in our plant in Tennessee, because we'd know who we were talking to, and we have good labor relations in all our other factories and other places in the world. And the legislature actually threatened the corporation that if they came in too heavy on the side of organization, they would withdraw the state subsidy for the continued production of the plant. And I thought it was just one of the weirdest things I had ever seen. I'm sure you have some insights into it. Yeah, and then right here. Yes, uh, you've spoken about the beneficial aspects of unions. Did you also, in your book, speak about the corruption that's existed and what effect that had, especially in New York City, within, yes. Don't forget New Jersey. Trash, no. New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and what effects that has had on the general aspect of labor unions and their relationship to um, adding more union members. Okay. 
You got NLRB, Volkswagen, yes, Union, right. Corp. So, so <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that. So I have a chapter called uh, Labor Self-Inflicted Wounds, but I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, so on the NLRB, um, I've been thinking of writing a story about how the Trump NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, kind of is the umpire during unionization elections, and it can set rules that make it harder to unionize or easier to unionize. It's a five-member board, and the president generally appoints three members from his party and two from the other party. And so the Trump Labor Board has taken many steps to make it harder to unionize. It's, you know, it declared that you know, Uber and Lyft drivers should be considered independent contractors without a right to unionize and not employees. It's going to take away the right of graduate students to unionize. It's made it harder for like McDonald's franchisees to be declared joint employee employers, which will make it harder to unionize. It's looking at a rule to bar workers from being able to use their corporate email to discuss unionization issues. I mean, it's, it's moving very aggressively to uh, make it harder to unionize. Then, Mr. Ray, good to see you. Uh, very good question. So um, what happened in Tennessee is just bizarre. So Volkswagen, uh, you know, a German company, has co-determination. You know, workers have nearly, work representatives have nearly 50% of the members on the company's supervisory board. And in Germany, it's considered a very pro-worker company. And here in Chattanooga, in the first unionization drive in 2014, Volkswagen really remained very neutral and said, we're not going to oppose unionization. And that drove Tennessee lawmakers bat, whatever, you know, crazy. <laughs> uh, and they said, you know, this is going to hurt our reputation, our, our you know, all important business image if this important company unionizes. So they, you know, pull out all the stops to defeat the union effort. And they basically told Volkswagen that the second tranche, the second promise of subsidies, like 100, 200, 300 million dollars to build a second line you know, they, they would cancel that. And that made the workers very, very scared that if we only have one production line and never get the subsidies for the second production line, our factory might not survive. So that really, really scared people and, and I think in, you know, encouraged a lot of people to vote against the union. Plus, you had people like Grover Norquist, you know, Mr. Anti-Taxes. He launched a big campaign against the union there because he was worried that if the UAW got a foothold in Tennessee, They'd push for all sorts of terrible things like better schools and better unemployment insurance for workers, <laughs> and that would mean higher taxes and, and, and maybe more Democrats would be elected, and they didn't want that. So even while Volkswagen remained neutral, there are a lot of forces pushing the workers to vote against the union. In the second round uh, this year, last year, where the union, the UAW again lost, Volkswagen wasn't as neutral. They became somewhat more anti-union and you know the the UAW I think shouldn't have you know held the election before it had enough support I think it should have pushed harder to make sure it had like 70 percent of the workers for it before the company launched the, the company and, and the Republicans launched an all-out effort not the company but the Republicans and others an all-out effort to defeat the unionization effort so corruption you know, I, I, I read a lot about union corruption. I, you know, I write about uh, you know, the Teamsters and the Longshoremen and, and, uh, and Jock, you know, Jock Yablonski. Uh, uh, what, what, what's the name? The head of the Mine Workers, Willing, Workers Union. I'm blanking on his name. You know, killing Jock, Tony Boyle, killing, you know, ordering the murder of uh, you know, this courageous union dissident, Jock Yablonski, in 1969. And uh, the journalist in New York, uh, who wrote? You know, who was a f famous columnist on labor? Victor Riesel. Yeah, you know, I'm having these senior moments. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Victor Riesel. You know, wrote. You know, he he was a syndicated columnist. He wrote just about labor. He's more than 200 newspapers. He wrote a column about corruption in the Operating Engineers Union. And four days later, someone came up to him as he was leaving Lindy's restaurant, on 47th Street. I can't remember his name, but I remember the name of the restaurant. And uh, you know, they threw acid in his eyes, and he was blinded. And and that played a key role in getting the U.S. Senate to begin years-long investigations into unions. And and you know, as I said before, the Gallup poll just found that 
the union approval rate is the highest it's been in 50 years, 64%. The highest it's ever, ever been was in 1957, we're in a 75%. And then after all this corruption, after the Victor Riesel uh, horrible incident, you know, that was the absolute peak in union approval and it's gone down since there. And, you know, there was, you know, Jimmy Hoffa and the, uh, and the Central States Pension Fund and, and, you know, workers' pension funds being used to finance uh, lots of corruption and, and mafia things. So, you know, I often get into arguments with people. They say union corruption is, much, is so, so bad. And I say union corruption is no worse than corruption in government, especially nowadays. I, mean, I know I'm sounding partisan. <laughs> especially now. No, I, I think, and, you know, and no worse than, than business corruption. I mean, look at Purdue Pharma. Look at all the corporations that back climate denial. I mean, that to me is corruption too. But, I, you know, I think there's much less union corruption than there was in the 50s and 60s. I think the federal government has gotten too little credit. They've done a very good job cleaning up a lot of unions. There's still pockets of corruption, unfortunately, in the UAW right now. But there's much, much less than there used to be. And, and whenever there's corruption, it really hurts unions when they seek to unionize. So the corruption, you know, this scandal in the UAW right now really hurt the UAW during the unionization effort at Nissan in Mississippi. Okay. Uh, wow, I got lots of questions. Uh, one, two, three. We'll do three again on this side. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Olash. Uh, you haven't talked very much about the legal restrictions on the right to strike. There is Taft Hartley outlawed the secondary boycott. Uh, basically, there's all sorts of federal laws, use of injunctions, and it seems this really limits uh, workers' power. And unless we address that issue and workers regain the right to strike, I see it being very difficult to build really strong unions. Hi, I'm Ann Guthrie, and um, are you a granddaughter? A gr no, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, so I've been working in workforce development for the last decade, and I guess as a millennial, I haven't really focused on unions very much. I mean, they're always in the back of my mind, but more. More often, focus on policy on minimum wage and and breaks and and protection for workers, and less on the union end of doing so. I'm wondering now that you know the focus has shifted, and I, I want to learn more about it. Um, what can we learn about unions who have made in the past who have become too powerful, and maybe done some more harm than good? Not on the corruption end, that's obviously bad, but. Um, Public unions in, in California, some of the consequences of that is cities are going bankrupt. You know, like what can we learn about? Can a union be too powerful and how can we use that today for to, to learn lessons? Okay. And Hi, Tim Noah from Politico. Um, I'd like to follow up on the partisan point because um, I, I don't think there's any question that certainly at the level of leadership, the Republicans are the anti-union party and the Democrats are the at least marginally pro-union party. Um, and I think that has been self-evident since Reagan's presidency. Uh, and yet in the last election, we saw very weak support for Hillary Clinton among union households. I think uh, 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 she actually had only a minority of white union households, or maybe it was white uh, union members. Um, so my question is, uh, why don't union members uh, uh, vote their union interest? So uh, thanks. To, so on secondary boycott, you know, the Taft Harley Act was passed in 1947 uh, after the largest wave of strikes in American history in 1946 that helped sweep Republicans into power for the first time in Congress since the 1930s, and they quickly passed some anti-union actions because they thought unions were too strong, speaking of partisanship. And, and, and they, it was passed over Truman's veto. And part, and part of that effort to weaken unions was they banned secondary boycotts. Now, as someone who wasn't alive when there were secondary boycotts, I've never really gotten a good sense of how powerful a weapon they were. A secondary boycott is if you're uh, say, in a contract dispute with a supermarket. You could also order a boycott against a trucking company, stop me if I'm wrong, that delivers to the supermarket. And, and by making life difficult for other companies that work with your target company, that was a very powerful weapon. 
and, and Congress said you can't do that anymore. Um, the great boycott was a secondary boycott. It wasn't boycotting the growers directly. It was like ordering a boycott against supermarkets. But, it, but because farm workers are not covered by the National Labor Relations Act, they were allowed to do secondary boycotts. So you know, some of the presidential candidates, Bernie Sanders in his labor platform was saying, we should restore secondary boycotts. I don't, I, it would certainly help unions. I'm not sure how much it would help. It might help a lot, I, I, because I, I, I never really studied how effective secondary boycotts were. But, I'm, but I take issue when you say there's no right to strike. There is a right to strike. You know, but you know, we are the only industrial nation that allows strikers to be replaced by you know, permanent replacement workers, which really weakens the ability to strike. Um, are unions sometimes too powerful? You know, it, you know, uh, it depends on whose ox is gored. I mean, certainly <laughs> some mayors in California or New York City will say the policemen's union, the state troopers' union. You know, you know, I will agree that some you know pensions are too rich and cities can't afford them, and that there were mayors and governors who thought, I don't want to give a ten percent raise now because that's going to really squeeze my budget now. But I'll promise generous pensions. 30 years in the future, which will hit another governor and mayor. And I think a lot of them just didn't understand the, the actuarial math about how it would really bite back in 30 years. So one, you know, you know, some people say it's unfair that unions can contribute to you know, mayoral elections or city council elections or school board elections and they elect friends so that they, they're kind of sitting on both sides of the table. And I'm sure there are instances where that happens. You know, it's, you know, it's something that my, my friends get mad at me when I say, I was at my 40th high school reunion like 10 years ago. And um, there are all these friends from high school who like had taught for like 35, 38 years. This is in New York. And they're, they retired with like uh, pensions of 70, 75%, the multiple of 2% per year times 35 or 38 years. So they might have made 100,000, maybe even more if they had masters and were teaching in Great Neck or something. So they had pensions of 70, 75, $80,000. That's pretty good. And, and if you live another 25 years, that's $2 million. And I'd say maybe that's, maybe that's too rich. And friends of mine get very mad when I say that. But you know, that's, that's, you know, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and, and some people say certainly, you know, sometimes the steel workers at their prime, the order workers at their prime, uh, the, some construction workers, carpenters, they made a lot of money. And, and I think that was one of the things people resented about unions, that there was a real blue collar elite. And, and that angered some people. But, you know, the wage premium for steel workers and order workers isn't nearly as great as it was, say, in the 1970s. Now, Tim, uh, good question. You know, I, I got into huge arguments with my wonderful wife and wonderful daughter saying, I don't think Hillary Clinton is the best candidate for the Democrats. I, you know, I didn't think Bernie Sanders was going to win, you know, would have won either. But um, I thought, you know, Joan Williams, you know, professor at UC Hastings, wrote a wonderful article just a few days after the election saying, Hillary's big problem is she's not seen as a candidate of workers. She's seen as a candidate of the professional class of lawyers and Wall Street folks and Hollywood celebrities and, and high tech engineers. And, and I think people felt that. And, and Trump, who, I'm sorry, I think, you know, I follow, you know, I'm from New York. I followed Donald Trump for 30 years. I thought he was very dishonest 30 years ago. I thought he was a huge narcissist 30 years ago. I thought he was a huge comment 30 years ago. He hasn't changed. So um, I think he conned a lot of workers in, you know, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, saying, I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to bring back all the jobs. I'm going to stop plant closings. And I think a lot of them bought that. A lot of them really didn't buy it. They thought this guy, you know, is sort of full of it. But at least he, unlike Hillary, said, you know, shows that he cares about our issues. And and you, you know, and maybe you could assign one of your people to do this. To, you know, I haven't seen anyone do the definitive piece about why and where the unions fell short in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and 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 Michigan. You know, the unions say, well, you know, we did our best in those states. I don't think they did. And no one has really, you know, gone deep into the weeds to explore that. One, one yeah. surprising thing we yeah. do know is that the, uh, the third party vote among the union households was off the charts. So it right. really was an anti-Hillary 
Yeah, and, and, and you know, in the primaries, a lot of union members voted for Bernie over Hillary. And, and a lot of them thought neither Hillary nor Trump were good for them, and they voted for Jill Stein, which, you know, that's something else that needs to be investigated, her ties to Putin, but we won't go there. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's also very mysterious. Um, okay, I thought there were a couple of questions. So one, two, and then we'll close out. Hi, uh, I'm John Russo. Uh, and former director of the Center for Working Class Studies at Youngstown State, and now at the Kalmanovitz Initiative at, at Georgetown. Uh, I want to ask Steve a question that we've been talking about for about five or six years, and that's about the term precariat. We, we've had the, uh, I, I've come around on that. <laughs> we, we started this discussion six years ago, and the, the idea was that the term was not understandable, so we kept using the term working class or some other sort of nomenclature. Since what's happening now, and in many ways what Maureen and Aspen is trying to deal with is changes in the nature of work and precarity. And this large group of people, many of them younger people, but not necessarily millennials, that are part of this large group, of, which I call the precariat, and which you're now coming around to. But the question of it is, the laws really don't deal with this. The National Labor Relations Board is no help in this area because the whole nature of employment's changed. And I just wondered if you talked to anything about that in the book itself. Uh, ben Kreider, Brandeis University. Um, you were speaking about the last chapter was you know strategies for rebuilding worker power. Can you talk about worker centers and alt labor? Because uh, there's a whole movement going with unions and kind of what role that will play. OK, so funny story. So John Russo taught at Youngstown State University, very nicely invited me to speak in Youngstown like 10 years ago when my first book came out. And I gave a little speech. And the next day, my speech was lead story in the Youngstown Vindicator. Like, what? Anyway, uh, so uh, John, precar so you were really the first person with whom I discussed the term precar you know, the precariat. And I balked, I often balk at new terms, neologisms, <laughs> because you know, the average reader won't know what it means. You know, I was just telling Maureen, I don't use the phrase neoliberal or intersectional in this book, because you know, I think terms like that just turn off some people. Other people criticize me for not using them, I realize. And you know, so precarity has become much more accepted you know, compared with six years ago. I would call it not. I would. I would never use the term precarity. I call it precariousness because I think it's more accessible to people. But you know, the concept is better understood than it was five and ten years ago. I have a chapter in the gig economy. You know, I write at length about you know how unstable, uncertain, i.e., precarious jobs, volatile jobs have become, and you know. So we haven't discussed Assembly Bill Five yet in California, and and you know. So that. Bill, which basically you know makes it much easier to declare gig workers, precarious workers, employees rather than independent contractors, I think in many ways is the single most important thing done in the United States to date to fight precariousness. It's saying you know you gig workers, you know DoorDash, Uber drivers, you know your employees, the employer will you know you're covered by minimum wage and overtime. You're covered, you know, your employer will contribute to your Social Security and, and, and Medicare. They could still fire you at will. That's a whole other thing. And that's very hard to change. And, you know, Bernie Sanders in his labor platform has this radical proposal to move to a just cause standard for firing, for laying off people. But it's, it's hard to fix. You know, it, it's hard to fix. And, and, you know, in Europe, you know, where there are employment contracts and they've moved to you know, non, you know, hiring people without employment contracts, you know, that's become far more popular because employers feel much more willing to hire new workers when they don't feel constrained by employment contracts. Uh, we've seen a lot of that in France and Germany. Ben Kreider, thanks. Um, no, so I write about, you know, the Coalition of Mockley Workers and the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. Why did I write about them? And I devote full chapters to each of them. I was looking for the two most, what to my view were the two most successful worker centers in the, in the country. And I was going to write about the Workers Defense Project in Austin, which is also great, but 
the book is already somewhat long and you can't do everything. So I thought the Coalition of Mockley Workers is a great model because they've improved standards vastly for farm workers only through the private sector without, you know, without getting government to do anything for them. You know, they, they have Walmart and, and, and Trader Joe's and McDonald's as their enforcement mechanism. If a tomato grower uh, allows violations, then Walmart and Trader Joe's will stop dealing with them. So like, it's a really fascinating model to use some of the world's most powerful corporations as your labor enforcement mechanism. And then on the other hand, the Los Angeles Alliance for New Economy has also done an amazing amount. It's really been an amazing ideas factory for not, not only developing pro-worker ideas, but seeing them through to fruition. And they, unlike the Coalition of Mockley Workers, generally work you know, 98% by pushing public sector levers. And they've been phenomenally successful. And the work of the French Project in Austin, which has you know, done a very good job improving standards for construction workers in, in Texas, especially immigrant construction workers. And Texas had the highest fatality rate for construction workers in the nation. You know, they use both private sector you know, levers, you know, pressuring Apple and its billion dollar construction project to force its developers to do a better job and using the city council as a way to pressure developers. But I don't have, I don't write about 50 different worker centers. I, I really you know, wrote about some of the very best. Great, well thank you. I wanna close um, actually by reading the very last line of your acknowledgments. Um, where you write, lastly, I shall forever be thankful to my late parents, Mortimer and Cyril Greenhouse, who repeatedly taught me, as Dr. King taught, that all labor that helps humanity has dignity and that every worker, no matter how low paid or how humble, deserves respect. So I wanna thank your parents thank you. and thank you, Stephen Greenhouse, for sharing those lessons with us. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. So I also want to say that uh, we have books for sale outside. Um, Stephen is able to stay for a while to, to sign books. I encourage you to buy the book. It's really a great read. I also encourage you to come back on October 4th. We'll be talking about the making of a, uh, what, a, making of a democratic economy with our friends from the Democracy Collaborative, so uh, talking about ownership issues and all of those kinds of things. So please join us for that. And thank you all so much for, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.